Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Lola Cornish and I am your host for today. I'm a technical assistance specialist with Strategies TA. And today we're going to be, this is an introductory webinar really for our learning exchanges that will be happening in the future. So we're gonna go over a little bit of um, that information as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? So first, let me show you uh, some pieces that you may or may not be aware of in Zoom. Uh, we are, we have the mute button on the far left. So I'm reading left to right. Um, also, you can share your video or not if you so choose. And so that's the button just to the right of the mute button. The chat is where uh, we will communicate a lot of the time. Um, we have a lot of information to cover and a short amount of time. So please feel free to use the chat. We are asking that you hold any questions until the end, and then we'll have a chance for Q&A with the presenters. Um, and then finally, you can use those reactions. If you like, you can give a thumbs up, a high five, clap hands, um, things of that nature. Okay, next slide. So we are uh, strategies TA, and this uh, webinar is brought to you with between the generosity of the Office of Child Abuse Prevention, and we are a collaboration between the Child Abuse Prevention Center in Sacramento and the Children's Bureau of Southern California. And here we are, your team for today. So as I said, I'm Lola Cornish, and that's Wendy I'm holding in the picture, um, Senior Technical Assistant Specialist for Strategies TA. Bryn is our producer, she's our uh, data support specialist. And Lydia is the organizer and the backbone of these webinars. <laughs> and she's with the Children's Bureau of Southern California. So we wanted to go over um, just really briefly what our, our core values are at Strategies TA. And so these are the things that we uh, think about and try to approach our work th through these uh, lenses, if you will. So the first one's accountability, and that means being accountable for our work and inspiring others to do the same. Equity is our commitment to bringing awareness and change around equitable systems. Um, we value collaboration and connecting peers in the field to work together toward meaningful change. Community-based, so championing the community voice and really looking at how do we engage the community, which is a big piece of what we'll be talking about today and then strength-based, so building on the strengths of the communities and the teams that we're working with. Next slide. So um, these are the key components of our learning exchanges. So the, the learning exchange is an in-person or virtual group of people who share a common concern, problem, passion, or interest, and who've come together to fulfill both individual and group goals. So a thriving learning exchange cohort will have a clear purpose, goals that are aligned with the mission of OCAP's prevention planning, <laughs> trailblazers, sorry, <laughs> that are a benefit to the learning exchange members. As prevention planning trailblazers, excuse me, as learning exchanges progress, members support one another in their work and provide information and connection. So we're thinking that we'll probably have two online sessions of these learning exchange cohorts in the next two months. And we'll learn from each other and hear about the latest trends that are happening in child abuse prevention from OCAP and from the larger field in California and nationally. Um, and those of you who participated in learning communities with Strategies 2.0 rated the best part of those events as the opportunities to come together and network and learn from one another. And so this concept of the learning exchange cohorts really builds on that. Um, it is member driven. So that's the main um, difference is that it's member driven. So we're seeking people who can commit to attending all of the learning exchange cohorts or as, at least as many as possible. We'll be focused on child abuse prevention but the subtopics will be determined by the members um, who will identify specific areas to dive deeper in. We'll learn from each other and we can bring in subject matter experts to spark discussion. But what we really wanna uh, do is learn from each other. And we may engage in a project, maybe focus on a topic as, and the result is an actual product. 
So these are opportunities to go a little more in depth than the previous learning communities did and to share our knowledge, develop partnerships and relationships across um, counties. Here's our learning exchange cohort topics. So at the Strategies TA kickoff webinar, we asked about different areas of interest and these are the areas that were identified. So later in the webinar, we'll use the chat to capture if you'd be interested in becoming a member of this particular learning exchange. And in the evaluation, you'll have another opportunity. So here's our four topics, rural communities, which is um, focusing on issues that are specific to rural communities, the building community resilience and community engagement, um, learning exchange, which is what we're um, promoting here today, which is engaging communities in child abuse prevention and resilience work, COVID-19 and beyond. So how we're adapting to this interesting new world that we've come into and how do we continue our work during and after uh, the pandemic? And then finally, equity, really looking at addressing disproportionality in communities. Next slide. There's me again and my beautiful granddaughter, who I have to tell you the thing that she did yesterday that made me smile was um, she looked in a book. She's, a, she's 11 months old. She looked in a book and pointed to a dog and said, dog. So very proud of her. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, building community resilience. And this is the building community resilience model. We have a series of toolkits on our website, which we'll show you in a few minutes. Um, and the model is really a transformative approach to foster collaboration and build community resilience, as well as promote healthy communities. Um, it's a circular process of assessment, readiness, implementation, and sustainability. So the way that we have it organized is into four volumes. The first one focuses on building a shared understanding and working together to build community resilience. And this toolkit um, provides a succinct description of the core concepts of the BCR model and also the organizational and community factors related to building community resilience and to build a shared understanding of these things. So we're speaking the same language and we're engaging in collaborative learning. The second volume really looks at the state of readiness of the organization or network that's considering embarking on this work and focuses on provider abilities to respond and build supports. The third one focuses on connecting with and engaging uh, those cross-sector partners. So with, as you may know, with the child abuse prevention work that we're doing, we're looking at really broad-based cross-sector partnerships and this toolkit will really help you with that. And then the fourth one is really about sustaining that community resilience and looking at how do we communicate, how do we um, stay connected, how do we take advantage of our social capital, um, how do we train new leaders in this model. And all of those things go into making the building community resilience model. And frankly, it's a um, really useful series of toolkits. Um, I have been using them with uh, counties that I've been uh, consulting with, and um, it just really helps to look at where you are, where you want to be as far as building community resilience. Next slide. Did we skip a slide? Did my tree go away? Sorry. It <laughs> it's okay. It <laughs> That's somewhere. okay. I'm sorry about that. I'll just touch on it briefly. So we, um, we talk about in building community resilience, this pair of ACEs. So there's adverse childhood experiences that we've all heard about the study, I'm assuming. Um, but there's also adverse community environments that come into play. Those factors that really uh, affect the quality of life of the people that live in the communities. And so the pair of ACEs is included in the toolkits as well, and it will, uh, it just gives a really nice visual uh, for how you can understand how those root causes of you know, poverty and uh, substance abuse and all those kind of things can, can bubble up and really affect the children involved. Okay. 
Now you can go to the next one. So this is how to access the toolkits on our website. Um, I encourage you to look at them there in, in their entirety or just pick it uh, pieces of it. It's a wonderful um, set of tools that was established uh, for us by San Diego State University. And uh, you can find them on the resources tab on our website, which is strategyca.org. And a link directly to this page has been placed in the chat. If you need that link again, just let me know and I'm happy to send it again. Awesome, thank you. Okay, let's move on. So I'd like to introduce our first presenter today. Her name is Janet Arelas Quezada, and she grew up in the Bronx, the daughter of black immigrant parents from the Dominican Republic. After Wellesley College, she began a 20 year, more than 20 year career in nonprofit service in various roles, most recently at GLAD as the campaign managers for the Spanish language and Latinx department, honing her skills in communication, facilitation, and organization. Her passion is expanding equity and access. She joined the population change team in January, 2020 as a capacity building coach for the Magnolia Community Initiative. A writer and producer, she finds creative pursuits vital to peace of mind. And she lives in Pasadena, California with her partner of 20 years. Welcome, Janet. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm so happy to be here. And I'm actually here because my colleague, Lilia Perez, who's from Children's Bureau and is a part of the backbone organization of the MCI network, couldn't make it today. She's not feeling well. And so I will definitely share her email address at the end of this presentation so that you all can talk directly to Lily because she's the one who's doing this work um, and I'm supporting. Uh, you can see the here the vision of the MCI network, the hope and dream statement for MCI network. And I'm sure that it resonates with a lot of you. We're looking to make sure that the children and families in the 500 block area around Magnolia Place achieve all levels of achieve and break levels of success in education, health, quality of care, and economic stability. So I, I know that resonates with a lot of people. Next slide. Um, and next slide. As part of that process, there is an organizational fellowship that agencies in the net in the network send their middle management folks to go through this process of learning so that they can actually strengthen the collaborations to improve community success. And there was some thought in the network that they wanted to actually have a parallel process for community members. They wanted to launch a leadership academy. And they started, they created a work group where agency members and community members worked together to actually design what the academy was going to contain, all the themes and the lessons. But as part of that process, and I think, you know, it happens a lot when you're engaging with community, community started pushing back and they were saying, you know, we're here, we're part of these work groups, we're listening to this information and we feel like we're part of the process, but we're honestly not feeling like our voices really are being heard in the development of this leadership academy. And so we would like to have a pause and um, reconnect uh, reorganize this process to make sure that we as a community have more of a voice. So that happened pre COVID. So starting around January, the process of developing the Leadership Academy really came into the community's hands and we started to slow down and take a moment to listen and reorganize it so that there could be more community voice. Um, next slide, please. So what we all agree on, uh, Lily, the consultants that are involved, the community members, we know that what we want to achieve. We wanna make sure that the community members in the network actually know what the network is about. We want to um, help break social isolation. One of the things that we have looked at in the network over the years, there have been three neighborhood surveys that have been imp implemented door to door. And they have consistently found that a lot of people report that they don't know or trust their neighbors or they don't feel like they can lean on their neighbors when they need assistance. 
And so there's a lot of social isolation. Those numbers are always low. So we know we want people to get to know each other. We, we want people to get to know what the network is about. We so also community members express the need to um, get some information that could help them in their career goals, in their um, educational goals. And finally, we want at the network wants the community members to be able to sit on nonprofit boards, to sit on PTAs, to sit in neighborhood councils and to have their voice heard when people are making decisions about our community. So how does Lily do this? How does Lily get community members to be part of this process, especially during COVID? She puts posts on Facebook, letting folks know that there are two roles for community members in the leadership of the, in the development of the Leadership Academy. One is the facilitator role and one is the focus group participant role. Um, she has one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, telling them what it's about, letting them know what the expectations are for facilitators, what the expectations are for focus group participants. Um, she's reaching out to people who have been MCI ambassadors in the past, as well as new people that learn about it through Facebook or learn about it from word of mouth and they're interested in the process. And that's how she recruits. Next slide, please. And then um, the people who sign up who are interested in being facilitators come to our writing sessions and review sessions. And we start working on the content together. We're always checking to see if we're talking about the built environment, how does this resonate with you? How does this connect back to your experience? And what's great is we get to hear from people in the room. There are some people who have had experiences with change in their community. Like for example, they've improved a park, <clears throat> made it a, a place where people could uh, work out and children could have uh, safe places to play. So they talk about their experiences doing that. And then we also have people in the room who have no experiences doing anything to try to strengthen or make their communities better. And so they learn from each other. It's an open process. People can facilitate one week, the next week they can become a focus group participant and just give their opinions about the lesson. Um, we're meeting people where they are. We try to create a very warm environment where all of us, everybody who's involved is aware of um, being flexible, aware of all the pressures that we're under. All of us are at home. Some of us have kids, some of us have parents. Um, that we're taking care of. We are sometimes dealing with issues with Wi-Fi. We have computers, we have telephones. And so we try to be really flexible, really warm, really welcoming so that people feel that they can participate in the best way that they can. Um, and we coach to people's strengths. We give people an opportunity to do what they know. Um, if they don't know anything, uh, they can learn and stretch and grow. If they already have some experience, they can teach others. So I want to highlight Efrain Hernandez. Efrain Hernandez was recruited by Lily to come to the review writing session, and he had never done anything in the past with MCI. He really didn't know about the network, and he didn't know about facilitation. Um, he went through the process, he, he gave opinions about what he was looking at in terms of the presentation, and then he went to the practice session with Lily. And at that session, there happened to be about seven facilitators. And so some of them were thinking, well, maybe, you know, three of us could facilitate and four of us could watch this time. And he was actually new, but he said, you know what? I I want to get my feet wet. I think everybody should have a slide. Everybody should have an opportunity to facilitate this time. We're only gonna learn by doing. And so they did and they facilitated and then he's continued to participate. So that's an example of Efrain's experience. Next slide, please. And then um, here's Rosalva's experience. Rosalva actually is experienced. She was an MCI ambassador. Um, Lily recruited her to come be a facilitator. She did facilitate the first lesson, the second lesson, and then she got COVID. And not only did she get COVID, but people in her family got COVID. And so she wasn't able to facilitate the third session, but she showed up to be one of the focus group participants for that session and so that she could still give her opinions about the lessons that were being developed. And to me, I think I love this story because it shows that, I mean, we're all going through some challenges right now in terms of being distracted and 
having a lot of um, pressures on us and it makes it really hard to engage in meetings and to participate, but she felt the need to be part of the process. Um, and we're still trying to learn why. So we're hoping to uh, implement a survey to ask the facilitators, you know, how they heard about it, what it's their feedback on the process, why do they continue participating, what they're learning, what um, you know, all these questions that we have to try to get more of an understanding of why it's working. We know that it's working. It's one of my favorite things that I'm doing any any day of uh, the week when we get to do re, re, uh, writing sessions, review sessions, and when we get to do the focus group. But we want to learn more about why. Um, I think that this is it shows what we've been doing and um, all the lessons have a video from community partners so that allows our cross-sector partners to talk about the concept of the built environment or to talk about community mobilization or to talk about social determinants of health through a video so that people in the in the focus groups and the writing sessions get to know the agencies that are part of the collaborative um, there's always a breakout group so that people feel a little bit more comfortable talking to one person or two people. They're always real world examples of what all of the concepts look like in the neighborhood. There are polls so people can participate and give their opinion. Data related to each theme so we get to practice looking at bar graphs and circle graphs and understanding percentages and things like that. We always talk about things in a systems lens and we're practicing and learning together as a community how to talk about looking at things from a systems lens in a way that makes sense to everyone involved. We always revisit the information about the network, the mission, vision, so that people come away with information about the network and want and knowing how to still engage with the network if they stop engaging with this process. We always include reflection questions so that people have an opportunity to think about how whatever they looked at or learned that day integrated back into their own experience. And we share resources related to the topic. And we always invite people, if you want to continue exploring this topic or this idea, this is where you can go. Next slide, please. This is an example of the actual job description of a facilitator that Lily shares with people on Facebook. And she shares over text with people who want to be potential facilitators. Um, and she thought it was really important to make sure that they knew what were some of the skills that they would have that they would gain as a result of participating because she wanted to make sure that community members felt it was beneficial to them. Next slide, please. And um, it's really an open process. So although the MCI network uses the 500 block area around Magnolia Place as a as the place where they survey to see if the work is having impact of their collaborative, the development process for the Leadership Academy is open. So we have members who live outside of those boundaries who are also facilitators and focus group participants. Next slide, please. It takes time. That's one of the things that I think Lily also wanted to stress and I wanna stress that it really takes a lot of time to have conversations with people, to recruit them, to get them over their fears of participating in a process, to actually integrate the feedback from the focus groups about the lessons. People tell us this didn't work, that word didn't work, or I don't understand that, or that was too fast or too slow, and we have to figure out how to change our content. And we're doing that in Spanish um, with some translation in English. If there are people from the network that want to participate, that we need translation. So it requires time, translation, patience, a lot of, um, a lot of those things. Next slide, please. And um, when we, when she recruits them, she lets them know any Friday you can come from 3.30 to 5.30. You don't have to facilitate. You can just come observe. You can support. If you know about Zoom, you can help support during the meeting. You can record videos. So not only do agency partners record videos for the lessons, but community members have recorded videos about things that they have done with um, things that they have done in the community to make the community better. So they're uh, sharing their leadership journeys um, as part of the process. Or you can offer feedback or you can help recruit other members. There's just a lot of different ways of participating in this process. Next slide, please. And this is what we've done so far. So we've actually developed six out of the 14 lessons 
for the Leadership Academy. We've had about 15 or so facilitators. So not in each session, there might have been two and one, three and one, seven and the one that Efrain uh, participated in. I think we tried to calculate how many hours community members are have uh, worked on this process and we came up with 254, but that might change. Um, 18 people have participated in focus groups. Two community agencies have provided videos for lessons and one agency has provided ongoing support. Next slide, please. I think that might be the last slide. Oh, yes, that's the last slide. So that's the process, but I'll put Lily's email address in the chat so you can connect with her and she can tell you more about what she's been doing to develop this Leadership Academy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janet. It's, um, it's encouraging to hear about this process and how engaging it, it, it really is with the community members. We uh, struggle when thinking about child abuse prevention with how do we get the community involved and what's the, you know, the benefit to them. And so I think this is a, a, a really intriguing model, um, probably challenging to replicate. And I hope that you'll continue to share your progress over time. Thanks. Next slide, please. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time in a breakout group um, thinking about resilient communities and what that means to us. So, um, Oh, so um, I, I hope that if this was your first uh, experience using Jamboard that you enjoyed it. And we want to hear a little bit, I, I've been kind of stalking your Jamboards as you've been working on them, but we want to hear a little bit um, from you all. So if you would be willing, share like your top one or two um, items that you put on your board in the chat for us. Um, so we were group five, and one of our first things was the hope for people's basic needs to be met. So food, sanitation, housing, et cetera. Um, and then one of our group members actually had a really neat experience going to Germany for a social work program. And she talked to that experience about um, them putting containers out in the winter for homeless people. And then a social worker actually going out to them each week to check on them and bring them food or whatever else they need. Um, and I just think we had a really great discussion about looking to other countries um, or even places in the United States um, for ways to, you know, build a, a sustainable, um, really engaged and thriving community. Wow, thank you for sharing. So it sounds like it was a wonderful discussion. Anyone else, else want to share one of their top? One or two ideas. I see that one group says they didn't have a jam board. That, yes, that was group eight. We didn't have a jam board, but we had some great discussion. And I think the common thread with everybody was that um, they reduced what they were doing in their agency down to just trying to meet families' basic, basic, basic needs at this point. And, mm -hmm. you know, that is helping them thrive and getting them back to the point where they can, um, you know, have a little higher community influence, but right now it's just making sure people have toilet paper and internet and food and diapers. Mm -hmm. and Great, well, thank you for sharing. And I see in the chat, Barb DeGraff said, families are connected, supported, know how to access needed services. Great ideas for marrying the delivery of essential services like diapers with the delivery of vital information. And they also like the use of libraries as community hubs. Any other groups want to share? Well, this is Mike from, uh, we were in group six and mm -hmm. um, I really, there was one and we talked about it um, and I, I actually like the person who put the, the sticky up on our board, I'd love her to share the story that she shared because it was just so powerful. But um, one of the things that came up on our board and by the way, we loved uh, Jamboard. I don't think any of us had actually used it before, and we had so much fun with the post-it notes and the pictures getting thrown up there. Uh, it was a kick. Anyway, um, but uh, one of the post-it notes said, build a, build a community where people can lean in and lean on one another. And it was just a powerful statement about 
the um, the 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 cross culture of being able to support and somebody who who is a who who had to lean on um, in the program that they were talking about then had the ability to be the person that could that could lean in um, and that and that reciprocal kind of nature of building a thriving community being a collaboration of the lean in and the lean on and how how that worked it was just it was just beautiful so I, I really mm. thought that was a great statement about um, about a thriving community. Great, thank you. And it sounds like people really enjoyed using the Gen board, which is great feedback for us. We appreciate it. Um, Rosalind said, uh, thank you for the group discussion. Points from the discussion, a community that is validating, considerate, well-connected, and where community members feel safe and respected. Thank you, Rosalind. Okay, any final thoughts before we move on? Okay. Let's go to the next slide and our next presenter, which is Mike Baldwin, who you just heard speaking a moment ago. Mike has worked in the field of children, youth, and families for over 27 years. He received his undergraduate degree in sociology from California Baptist University and earned a graduate degree in educational psychology from the University of Nevada at Reno. Mike has served in a variety of positions in his career, including being a school principal, college professor, professional trainer, and program manager. And he's currently the director of statewide AmeriCorps programs for the Child Abuse Prevention Center, where he oversees programs across the state of California that serve children, youth, and families. Mike has always had a passion for helping families thrive and will continue to be an advocate for them. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Lola. You know, it's funny when you hear somebody actually read that, uh, now I realize why I feel so old. Um, but that's just the way it is. And you know, the gray hair comes along with it and I'm okay with that. Um, so I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak to you today um, from uh, about the AmeriCorps programs that we um, administrate and, uh, and work with here at the Child Abuse Prevention Center in North Highlands, California. Um, and so I wanted to kind of, I'm not knowing uh, everyone's experience and their maybe knowledge about AmeriCorps. I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about AmeriCorps, talking about our programs, and then some perspective on how AmeriCorps can really help a community engage and thrive um, with, you know, with the support of AmeriCorps members, um, you know, for, for programs. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. And then keep moving because I'm going to talk about AmeriCorps now. So a quick question, if you guys wouldn't mind before I kind of get into this, um, does anybody know, and just throw it into the chat if you know the answer, uh, does anybody know when the AmeriCorps program actually started? What year did AmeriCorps start? We have a guest from the chat, which is 1993. 1998 is another guess. All right. Well, everyone is, yep, yeah, everyone's really close. And in fact, um, oh, oh, there's some, okay, so there are people out there that know the whole story about the AmeriCorps program, because I'm starting to see some different years here. Uh, so the AmeriCorps program, as it is right now, actually started under the Clinton administration in, uh, it was actually put into law in 1993, and the first year of service that occurred was 1994. So those of you who said 1993, you're dead on. Uh, I, would, I would be throwing candy if this were a live training right now, but I can't do that since we're virtual. Uh, so just imagine I'm throwing candy out to those people who answered the question right. Uh, for those people who went back into the 60s, I am actually, I'd be throwing you several pieces of candy because if you go back into the history of AmeriCorps, it actually started back with Lyndon B. Johnson back in 1964 with his um, War on Poverty, which is where the VISTA program, which I'll speak about in a bit, um, actually started back in 1964. So VISTA is actually the oldest, um, uh, the oldest uh, national service program uh, having started in 1964. And then many prog service programs actually got compiled, put together under one federal agency in 1994 in the uh, Clinton administration um, that we now know as AmeriCorps. 
So AmeriCorps is a national service program. Um, under AmeriCorps, there are several federal programs, four main branches, which is the AmeriCorps State and National, which I'll be talking about as one of them that uh, we run out of our office. AmeriCorps VISTA, which stands for Volunteers in Service to America, also one that I'll talk about because uh, we run it out of our office. Um, there is the National Civilian Community Corps, the NCCC. And then we also have um, the, actually the one of the newest ones is AmeriCorps Seniors, which is a fantastic program where uh, um, um, people over 55 years of age can sign up to do national service um, as an AmeriCorps senior and provide all kinds of great service across the nation. The purpose of AmeriCorps is really to help communities tackle pressing problems. As you'll kind of hear about is when I talk about our programs, um, we're, we're really about tackling those pressing problems in a community that are very community based through our programs um, and create that lasting impact um, in the community served. High impact, creating um, those thriving, engaged communities. Um, and approximately 80,000 people across the United States are engaged in national service every year. And that number continues to rise every year um, with continued uh, support for the AmeriCorps program um, in the federal government. Next slide. So what does service actually mean? Well, service is kind of like being a volunteer. So a person who serves is a community member um, and they apply. It's like, it's kind of like getting a job where you apply, you put in an application and then you are hired as an AmeriCorps member. Uh, they enter into a contract for one year. And so it's identified for a one year contract, but a member can actually serve four full terms of service. Mm -hmm. Members provide service to the community. Um, they receive training so they can serve the community. And as you'll hear about, um, will develop as a professional in the field that they've chosen. Next slide. All right, so, um, so what are the kinds of things? Now, here's where I'm kind of going to get into the two programs that we run, which are the national, uh, the state and national program and the VISTA program. So what are the things that a AmeriCorps state and national member can do? A state and national member can do direct client services. Um, they are the feet on the ground doing the work with folks. As you'll hear, you know, we do mentoring programs, we do early education programs, and those AmeriCorps members are working directly with the foster youth, directly with the kids in schools to provide services to increase their outcomes. Um, uh, everything that they do is aligned with our grant deliverables, so we actually have um, some very specific things that we have to do as part of our programs. And then kind of a national standard is volunteer recruitment and coordination. AmeriCorps members are actively looking for ways uh, to engage people to help a program, a partner to, um, to volunteer. Okay, so that's kind of the basics for a state and national. For the VISTA program, it's a little different. A VISTA actually does indirect service. So they're not directly involved with the participants in your program but they do activities that are more about capacity building for your organization. And they will work on projects such, such as fundraising. Um, we have a VISTAs that do volunteer recruitment and build systems by which people can track and engage volunteers. Um, oftentimes they will do, we have several of our uh, members right now that are doing social media campaigns to help engage the community in what an organization might be doing. So it's really more be you know, back office, um, uh, back office uh, service to build the capacity of an organization. Um, I, I actually think this is a fantastic, I love the VISTA program uh, because I, I have seen members do incredible things to help an organization have a, an, an incredible impact by building systems within the organization. So VISTA is, uh, I'm just a big fan. I'm a, a big fan of uh, state and national as well, but I really think VISTA is a great program uh, because it's about uh, helping organizations, not just individuals, to engage in a, a larger impact. All right, next next slide. All right, so the CAP Center. Um, go ahead and keep going. The CAP Center, you've heard about a few things that we do as Strategies TA in collaboration with the Children's Bureau is, you know, working on that. Um, Child Abuse Prevention Center is actually an umbrella organization over several nonprofits and organizations that we uh, that we um, that we uh, have under that umbrella. Uh, the first one, Child Abuse Prevention Council, that's really a Sacramento-based um, uh, uh, organization, 501c3, where we run all of our local initiatives, our AmeriCorps program through the Child Abuse Prevention Council of Sacramento. Uh, we are also the California chapter 
of Prevent Child Abuse America. So our Prevent Child Abuse California organization, 501c3, is the 501c3 where we function um, or where all of our statewide programs function, all of our AmeriCorps programs um, and, and, you know, very much, uh, you know, in that vein. And then the other one that um, you've probably heard about, but maybe not, is the California Family Resource Association. Um, it is an organization under the uh, umbrella of the Child Abuse Prevention Center that supports family resource centers with advocacy, training, technical assistance um, uh, across the state of California. All right, keep going. Next slide. So the CAP Center, um, kind of the services that we provide, and this is over all of our programs, we serve actually um, uh, around over 140,000 children and families per year through all of our programs. So, and that's because we're spread across the state and we have um, anywhere from 200 to 300 AmeriCorps members serving in programs across the state any, uh, any specific year. Uh, we educate 50,000 parents a year. We provide training to over 300 agencies. Um, and train about 10,000 professionals annually in a variety of different things that we do across all of our programs. Um, we have been an AmeriCorps grantee since 1994. So those of you who, you know, recognize that AmeriCorps started in 1993-94, we were actually one of the original um, agencies that were funded at the time and during the Clinton administration to do AmeriCorps. So we're, we've been around the AmeriCorps world for quite a bit of time. And currently we have five AmeriCorps grants. Uh, one of them is really based just in Sacramento. Uh, the other four are actually statewide programs. So what does that mean? What do we do as an AmeriCorps provider? Go ahead and go to the next slide. All right. So as an AmeriCorps administrator or provider, uh, we actually do all of the fiscal programming and AmeriCorps administration. We write the grants, we're the, fund, uh, we're the funded agency, and then we work with partners across the state. Um, we work, uh, we do all the back office for member benefits, all the payroll, healthcare, everything that comes along with our AmeriCorps programs and the member uh, and, the, and administrating the AmeriCorps program. We are the, responsible for um, ensuring that our performance measures are met, all of our performance targets, and we do all the reporting. And we do partner and member support, guidance, training, HR. We're kind of that backbone agency that does everything in the background so that our partners can focus on the work, can focus on the service. We're really here to support the programs that, um, that you all provide within your organizations, within your communities. And then we help with the AmeriCorps program and we administrate all of that behind the scenes. We're really here to support the program and support you and your community. All right, so next slide, and we're going to start talking about now really getting into what we do and what our AmeriCorps statewide programs really look like. All right, so go ahead and keep going. Next slide. All right, so the four programs that we have that are statewide, um, we have a foster youth initiative, and that program really focuses on foster youth outcomes. Uh, any of you who have worked with foster youth or if you've worked in communities, you know that foster youth outcomes are the lowest outcomes for that age group um, across California and actually across the nation. I'll give an example. Uh, the graduation rate for California is typically from year to year, um, in a, in a, for not for foster youth, but for, for all youth, the graduation rate typically runs around uh, 89 to about 94% on a given year, okay? That's a typical graduation rate for our schools in California. For foster youth, if you look at the foster youth outcomes for graduation, that actually drops to between 51 and about 56%. So that is, and I say that because that's really one of the focuses of our foster youth initiative is a mentoring focus. We set up AmeriCorps members to be um, uh, mentors and they mentor foster youth so that they can have better outcomes. What I can tell you about the outcomes we've seen over the years, we've uh, run a program like this, and we've done it for about 15 years now. Um, we have seen the graduation rate for those uh, youth that have come through our program to receive mentoring to go from that 51 to 56% for foster youth and jump all the way to the, to the state standard. So we're really seeing the impact of the mentorship as it, as it pertains to foster youth. Uh, we focus on foster youth between the ages of 12 and 21. So we really have a broad program, but 
um, it is uh, unbelievable the outcomes that we're able to see when we have foster youth engaged in mentorship. And um, and that's, that's a really a, a, a very important thing. It's a um, California initiative right now that we are um, that we have been asked to and have been working on for quite some time. Um, we have the first five service corps program, AmeriCorps program, and that's all about kindergarten readiness. We place AmeriCorps members in preschools, in schools, in uh, Head Start programs where they can um, focus on and engage with young kids, uh, obviously ages two from about four or five, kindergarten readiness. And uh, their focus is to catch those kids that are behind in their milestones and work with them on social emotional development, work with them on literacy skills, work with them on math skills, and that's in the classroom. The other piece of that that we do is actually family literacy. So there's actually a component of the program where we do classes and family literacy and support families to support their children for further learning. And so it's this really holistic program in kindergarten readiness for those kids that are behind. We have our PATH program, Prevent Abuse Through Home Visitation. Um, it is a home visitation program that focuses on parent education. And we also have, it has actually two focuses. There's the first focus is home visitation and parent education. The second focus is, is family support, um, almost what you would call family triage, where we work with families in a, uh, in a uh, family strengthening kind of mode to engage those families, um, identify their needs, and help them become more, um, uh, more stable as a family and with short-term case management, anywhere from four to six hours of case management. And our hope is we engage those families and then they move into the parent education part. Really the idea, strengthen the family, get them so what they can actually feel as though they're strong enough and then step into parent education. Um, when you're worried about whether or not you can feed your kids, you're not as likely to enter into a parenting class, okay? Um, so that's really the purpose of that. And oh, not the next slide yet. Got one more. Go back. There we go. Um, and so those parents, um, then ultimately with this program, the focus is to help parents who are in danger of entering or are in danger of re-entering the child welfare system. So really that focus is around child welfare to engage those parents so that they have better outcomes. You'll hear me talk a lot about outcomes a lot of uh, better outcomes and not engage with CPS. And then last one is our VISTA program. And I've kind of already talked about that one where VISTA is really about organizational capacity building, um, developing those individual position descriptions for your organization to support your capacity in, in, uh, in building your organization to fight poverty. Uh, the VISTA program, uh, it's a little bit different as far as the AmeriCorps world is concerned. It is really about fighting poverty and that's really the key to that. All right, now we can go to the next slide. So how does AmeriCorps really engage or support connection with your community? Well, I, I, there's, there's nothing um, groundbreaking about what I'm about to say, obviously, but what it does is really increases your ability to outreach. Um, that AmeriCorps position can engage more community members and increase your outreach. Um, the one of the focuses, and this is kind of why when I when I talked a bit about the um, our our, our jam board uh, with the group I was in, um, where it where it said uh, people can lean in and lean on one another. One of the things we really focus on as an AmeriCorps program is to connect with people to become members who have lived experience within the field they're now trying to enter. For example, um, this year in our Foster Youth Initiative Program, 70% of the members that we were that we engaged were, foster, were former foster youth. And that was a huge key for us. We feel like that's really important. Um, when we engage members in some of our more social service programs, when it's around parent education, we will engage parents who have been through the program who have been engaged by other members and bring them on as a member so that they can serve that community because they have the lived experience and that community then, I mean, there's a, what we have found is that there's a better connection because it's somebody who has been there. Um, our programs are trauma-informed. We do a lot of training um, and all of our programs are strength-based. So we're always looking to find the strength and increase the strength and then engage parents in that process of, again, better outcomes. All right, next slide. 
Um, so one of the things that we always talk about when it when we're talking about that connection to the community is what we consider a three level benefit. So the partner organization is benefiting. Um, the benefit to the partner is to extend and expand programs. You know, if you can only serve this many clients and all of a sudden you now have some people who, okay, now we can expand, we can extend a little bit. Um, so that's a huge benefit for the partner. Um, increase, increase efficiency, huge partner benefit. Um, provide increased opportunity to your participants and then really to have greater impact. I mean, that is our whole purpose, greater impact. The target population who you're trying to serve, obviously there's increased access when you have more people who can engage and do the work, parent education, uh, early childhood, uh, early childhood, uh, foster youth, you've increased access by having more people to actually engage and focus in those areas. And then obviously the services that are provided, as I talked about, the impact of AmeriCorps can have a massive impact through the services that are provided. So the target population, there's a huge benefit. But not often do we think about the AmeriCorps member as the service person. What's the benefit to them? Well, that's one of the things I personally have loved about AmeriCorps uh, for a very long time. And that's because the AmeriCorps program and the AmeriCorps members also get a massive benefit out of what they uh, what they experience as an AmeriCorps member. So first off, and I, I'll kind of use my example about the foster youth, the 70% of our foster youth who engage as, uh, as mentors in our program. Most of the time, this is their first opportunity to engage in a position in a professional environment where they're getting training, where they're getting um, great supervision, where they are getting kind of a look into what it looks like to do social services. So this becomes an opportunity for people to serve as members without a lot of experience oftentimes, but be engaged in a process and that professional environment then uh, really builds them to that next step. Um, there is a living allowance that comes along. So our members always have, it's, it's, it's kind of like a job, even though I'm not supposed to call it that, but there is a living allowance that comes along with serving as a member. Um, there's health insurance that comes with it for members who serve in a full-time capacity. There is childcare support. Um, because the living allowance, I would love to see uh, say that it's a great income. It's not. Uh, we have to play within the federal government guidelines for what the living allowance can be. However, the federal government, as they set up the program, identified that they wanted to reduce or eliminate barriers for people to serve. So childcare is actually one of the things that is provided to members that qualify. Um, and then there is an education award. Um, this year, the education award is just a little over $6,000 from the federal government. And that goes right into an account that members can use for their furthering their education at college or to pay off student loans, all kinds of stuff. In California, for full-time members, um, for an, and a full-time member means that they serve 1,700 hours in a year. For full-time members, the uh, state government has actually wanted to support the AmeriCorps program in a further way. So they've added roughly $3,000 or so to the education award. So it's a total amount in California of $10,000 for a person each year as they serve to get that benefit. So a, a member who, who um, serves two years will walk away with $20,000 worth of education support. Really huge benefit. And then the last thing, the professional training, um, the supervision, that member gets a great opportunity to get some really great professional training um, and I could, I could list the trainings, but there's so many of them, I, I won't even start. So really that three-tier benefit, huge part of connecting with your community and engaging the community and the members from your community in opportunities. All right, next, next slide. All right, so uh, the, the real question then is, uh, we've been doing this a long time, when COVID hit, what did we do to keep up with COVID? Because a lot of what I've talked about is direct service with clients. As I'm sure you guys already know, that transition from going to a direct service um, kind of mode to doing a lot of virtual services, how do we do it? Well, uh, there's actually a couple of different ways. Uh, utilizing the virtual platforms, um, let's say parent education and mentoring. Um, it was very difficult to connect with the families and the youth. Once we figured it out, now we have parenting education happening in a one-on-one -on -one home visitation setting through Zoom. 
through phones. And we do have that same issue that was brought up um, in, in our, was brought up in our, uh, on the Jamboard for our, um, our group earlier was technology is a problem. Some people don't have the technology. So there are some sites that have gotten really creative in how they do these services, um, how they're able to do them in a virtual world by providing and or um, sustaining certain types of activities in a distance way, but still able to provide the services regardless of technology or for those who have technology, the virtual platforms have been amazing. Uh, but as you know, I'll just use our uh, program for um, early childhood. As you know, schools have been shut down. How do we engage with families on that one? That's been really difficult. Um, and so we're, we're, gonna, we're really excited about the possibility of schools kind of coming back online here as soon as it's safe. Um, however, one of the things that I haven't said about AmeriCorps is a portion of AmeriCorps, even though we have direct deliverables, when there is a local emergency, a local um, situation, or a national emergency, AmeriCorps is who the government goes to as their first call. So that's what happened this last year. Um, everyone knew food banks were having a huge, huge problem trying to get volunteers and maintain a level at which they could serve the need last year. Our AmeriCorps members in California, um, I can tell you in just our program, our members were part of food distribution serving over 50 to 60,000 families in food distribution services, whether that was at a food distribution with a local school, food distribution at a food bank, um, meals on wheels, supporting all of those types of programs, AmeriCorps members entered into that. Um, we had members that were doing educational kit distribution for families that were struggling with their kids at home. This is how we engage the educational community. We had, we had members that were um, very involved in the COVID testing site support. Um, and then also doing crisis line, as you guys probably know, crisis lines went through the roof as soon as COVID happened. So we had AmeriCorps members that were signing up doing crisis line types of support. It was an amazing turnaround. Um, and we're still doing a lot of that. In fact, most of it we're still doing across our AmeriCorps programs in this program year. One thing that has just recently been added, and this is just in the last couple of weeks, is now that the vaccine distribution has now kind of hit a, um, you know, kind of hit that spot where they need some support. Um, once again, the state office actually called our AmeriCorps programs last week or two weeks ago, two weeks ago, had a meeting of the AmeriCorps programs, asked our input about how we could respond, and this week have been able to connect our AmeriCorps members to local community efforts for COVID vaccine distribution. So really, it's been an amazing journey through COVID, uh, but watching the AmeriCorps program step up, step out, and serve has been a real pleasure from, from my vantage point because I see the impact on communities. Um, and so I'm a, as you can probably tell, I'm passionate about it and I am a big uh, advocate for the AmeriCorps program, but not just because it's a program that serves families, but it's a program that can also mold into a much larger emergency response. Um, it, it's an amazing thing. Uh, so. That is all about everything we do. Uh, next slide. Um, if you are interested, if you've heard something that you're like, hey, wow, that sounds kind of neat. If you're interested in getting more information about one of our AmeriCorps programs, or if you'd like information about becoming a partner, um, just contact me. Um, my contact information is on the screen and, um, I, and you can call me, email me. Um, I, would, I would love to hear from you because we are still recruiting partners. We have space. And we would love to engage with you. So if there's one of the programs or maybe multiple programs that you're interested in hearing about, give me a call. And again, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lydia, for reaching out to me and allowing me a, to be a part of this today. I hope I didn't talk too long. I stopped looking at my clock, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you're fine. You. Thanks, Mike. I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about the timeline for America. AmeriCorps, though, because it, it, it is on a different fiscal year than uh, most of us are used to. Absolutely. Um, so actually, there is a difference, and, and, uh, and I'll try to explain it succinctly, but there's a difference between how VISTA works and how state and national works. So state and national, um, our programs typically start and end pretty much with the school year, okay? Most of our programs uh, begin, and that's on a yearly cycle, so they begin on August 16th and then end a year later on August 15th of the next year. So 
when we're looking at partners right now, we're kind of in between, but we would love to start the conversation for that. If you would be interested in bringing somebody on stay for one of our state and national programs by, um, you know, by August 15th or September, there's a couple of differences there, but primarily by August 15th of 2021, because that's our next round of bringing on AmeriCorps members. In the VISTA program, uh, VISTA actually has what, what's called a rolling enrollment. So if you're interested in the, pro, in the VISTA program, it takes a couple of months to kind of get things um, rolling as a VISTA partner. Um, but um, uh, we can be bringing on members um, as early as, if we did it really quickly, we could bring on members as early as May, but more likely we would be able to engage a partner and have a, a member in place by say June uh, at this point, because VISTA has a lot of steps that we have to take to get that, to get that thing going. Um, so we've got the rolling enrollment for VISTA, but our state and national program right around August 16th is when we start. And we typically like to um, start that process about two and a half months prior to the beginning of the program uh, so that we can, you know, get all of the logistical stuff out of the way and uh, actually have a very robust recruitment um, as you would be recruiting for members along the way. Great, thank you. Sure. I um I typed in the chat earlier that I had the benefit of being an AmeriCorps supervisor several years ago, and it was an incredibly rewarding experience. And we were able to reach out into the community in ways that we couldn't with our other staff, and so it really was um, a great great experience. All right, we need to uh, wrap up. We're getting right down to the ten thirty time. Well, so. Um, a lot of questions in the chat about what's happening next. So you um, you will be getting a follow-up email that will have some specific information in it. And it's gonna ask this question as well. So when we think of community resilience um, and building community resilience and community engagement, what are some of the topics that you'd like to explore? Um, and if you could type that in the chat or share it in the survey that will be coming um, in the next couple of days. So you're gonna get an, uh, an evaluation with, with a SurveyMonkey link. Um, you're gonna get contact information for the team. Um, and, and you're gonna get information about us, sorry. The, uh, you'll get a link to the um, webinar that we've recorded that will be on our YouTube channel. Please sub consider subscribing. And then a link to those um, building community resilience toolkits. Okay, did we have any um, questions for the presenters before we finish up? I don't have any from the chat, but we still have, you know, a few moments. So if anyone's still typing, we just have lots of thank yous um, to our speakers for wonderful, informative presentations. It always goes by too fast. <laughs> <laughs> true. Okay. So just as a reminder, this will actually be posted on our YouTube channel. So please um, search strategies TA um, and you will be able to, to be able to rewatch this and also be able to subscribe to our channel so that you can get notified when we post new webinars up, up there. Thank you. Oh, and there's the link to the survey monkey evaluation in the chat I see. Thank you, Bryn. This has been very exciting and uh, very informative for me, as well as others, I'm sure. Um, so we got to look at some new skills. I see that we did get some suggestions in the chat about, uh, Shelly said, having an open discussion of systemic racism to help heal our communities. Um, that's definitely one of the uh, things that we think about a lot at Strategies. And actually, one of our um, one of our topic areas for the learning exchange cohorts is about equity and really looking at that. So stay tuned for the other uh, two webinars that will still be occurring as introductions to the learning exchange. When you um, have fill out that evaluation, there's an opportunity to um, to 
say that uh, if you'd like to be involved in the learning exchanges to join. And so um, we'd be happy to have you. Okay. 